Um, then I will start my presentation. And yes. So first things first, I would like to thank the organizers of the meeting uh, for both arranging this event and accepting my paper. This is my first time in Vaksha and the Linnaeus University, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be and present here. I hope my small contribution will not fail the organizers' faith in me. Uh, secondly, I would like to assert an important disclaimer. Uh, my text today is only work in progress, and as uh, some of my colleagues present in this room will confirm, I myself am not <laughs> entirely sure of uh, whether I am correct on the correct track in pursuing the problems that I shall touch upon or not. Therefore, I will immensely appreciate any critique, criticism, suggestions, and vistas on your part. So thank you all in advance. Uh, before I proceed to the main portion of my input today, I would like to specify the object of my research. In my uh, PhD project, I'm studying the formation of the social elite in Anglo-Saxon England and contemporary Scandinavia, uh, contempor uh, collectively called uh, Thanes. Um, what a Thane is, is a question that I'm not going to address directly right now. We, I will return to it a bit late, well, at the conclusion. But um, for, I would like to save you a great deal of time and just refer to the definition of an elite uh, as a sociological term by French historians Régine Lejean and Jean Feller. And in so doing, I'm following in the footsteps of Lars Hermansson and his fellow co-editors who adopted uh, this definition in their introduction to the second volume of their uh, Nordic Elites in Transformation uh, circa 1050 to 1250. In my imperfect Google translation from French, because my French is a bit uh, lacking, uh, the elite are, I quote, all those who enjoy a high social position, which means the possession of wealth, power, and knowledge, as well as recognition. Uh, what I'm talking today sounds a little vague in the formulation I deliberately chose, so I shall next refine my problematics for today. Generally, I've been able to tackle at least four problematic dimensions in the discussion of the Anglo-Saxon late elite. To set the scene, a social historian ought to formulate their theoretical view of A, what a society actually is, and B, how do uh, they view the social stratification as a phenomenon. Uh, and I myself have to disclaim that I lean towards the, the understanding by Max Weber and Michael Mann. Um, I will leave that for the discussion if anyone is interested, but um, this needs to be said, but I'm not going to dwell on this any further. Uh, however, British historiography concerning the Anglo-Saxon period has been somewhat, well, antipathetic in these both undertakings. Um, another shortcoming is that Anglophone medievalists often avoid defining their terminology and often employ lexemes in their colloquial meanings, be the word class, elite, uh, feudalism, violence, or what, what have you. Um, finally, though uh, sub-disciplines such as source criticism or legal history develop really rapidly in the Anglo-Saxon field, uh, the what we traditional call constitu constitutional history does not always follow suit. So there's a certain epistemological gap between those sub-disciplines. So my speech today will be structured inductively from the bottom to the top. First, I would like to offer you a case study. What was a Thane's were guild? as we can reconstruct it from the royal legal codes. Next, I'll try to con check, contextualize the functioning of the world in the Anglo-Saxon legal system. Um, and thereafter, I'll briefly touch upon their correspondence of this legal system and sociological observations. Finally, I shall recursively ask the question of why things world actually matters in studying the Anglo-Saxon society as such. Um, before proceeding, though, I should like to show you some maps of late Anglo-Saxon England. So, first of all, the political and geographical um, uh, composition of the kingdom would be as follows. So, we have the heartland of the monarchy in Wessex. We have the former kingdom of Mercia, which ceased to be an independent kingdom in the late uh, 9th century, but was later incorporated into the West Saxon polity. And then we have the uh, uh, remains of Northumbria, we do not see the English Northumbria depicted here, but believe me, so there was the Kingdom of York, which was supposed to be Scandinavian or under the rule of a Scandinavian dynasty. And further north, there lay uh, a, um, 
well, we can call it a polity because we're not sure of the actual legal status of this uh, unit, uh, which today we we'll call English Northumbria. And secondly, secondly, there's also a useful map from an atlas of Anglo-Saxon England by uh, David Hill. This is the reconstruction of how uh, legal borders functioned in Anglo-Saxon England roughly at the time of the Norman Conquest, so 1066 and maybe later. Um, this is important to bear in mind, but uh, the Danelaw here is a very colloquial understanding. Actually, the Danelaw is the part of York, so, well, well I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, the part of York is not exactly the part of Danelaw, but again, we will, we will stick to the conventional understandings of what a Danelaw is and so forth. Now, uh, to the main course. Uh, when asking what a thing's wiggle was and why it matters, we need to define what kind of legal phenomenon we're talking about. I like the definition by uh, Ruth uh, schmidt wiegand and John Hudson said it uh, even shorter. Basically, uh, a Wergeld is a man price, a price for homicide. So, if you were a hyperactive Anglo-Saxon um, and slew someone, uh, how much would you, be, would you be expected to pay for your homicide? Uh, if you turn to modern historiography, the answer will be in 100% cases, uh, 1,200 shillings. Uh, what is a shilling and how does it relate to the monetary systems? A shilling was not a coin, it was a unit of uh, accounting. Uh, the actual coin was actually a silver penny, which was a, between 1.1 and 1.3 grams of silver, uh, depending on the, uh, on the uh, issue. Uh, how many pennies were in a shilling? Um, either 48 or 60, and this will be important later on, um, so I'm very sorry in advance, there's going to be a lot of arithmetics. Sorry. Um, a 1,200 shilling wergeld was six times greater than uh, that uh, wergeld of a common freeman that called a churl. Um, the problem is that references to thanes are not as numerous or instructive as mentions of the so-called 1,200 men, so men with the 1,200 shilling wergeld. Uh, so, the implication is that we, if we equate these two straight, we will, we will deepen and enrich our understanding of how the society worked in Anglo-Saxon England from the 7th century onwards. Uh, the greatest systematizer of the Anglo-Saxon world ratios was uh, Henry Chadwick in the early 1900s. His explanation, however, hinged upon an assumption that there existed two fillings of a shilling unit. In early Wessex and later Mercia, a shilling was made up of four pence. But in later Wessex, it was five pence that made a shilling, which is why I said 48 or 60, depending on the time and uh, region. I'll leave the, his argumentation on the side for the sake of time, but let me uh, just say that though this evidence on the whole is compelling, it's almost exclusively indirect. Uh, how, um, how do we know about the 1200 shilling wergel for a thane? Surprisingly, uh, separately, uh, the thanes and uh, the 1200 men are mentioned numerously, but uh, there's only one occasion in the whole legal corpus when these are put in apposition uh, explicitly. And this comes from a text which is called Mirknalaga, or the Mercy and Laws in modern English. Uh, the only extant manuscript, a fragment of which you can see on the screen, comes from, well, the second half of the 11th century. Please do not sue me for uh, screening these images. I did include the link. Uh, please do not um, sue me for it. Uh, the same, uh, so what the text says is that according to the Mercian law, uh, the uh, Charles Wergild is uh, 12, uh, sorry, 200 shillings, whereas a Thane's Wergild is six times as much, that is 1,200. Uh, the same folio in the same manuscript contains another legal text, uh, which is today colloquially called the Nor North Leo de Laga, or the law of the northern people. Who these northern people are, we do not know. Uh, most commonly, we think it's the Northumbrians, but go figure. Um, gen um, the, these laconic provisions are much less straightforward. So this is the same fragment from the same manuscript. Uh, I underlined the um, relevant parts. <clears throat> so uh, these laconic uh, provisions are much less straightforward. First, they empl employ an otherwise unparalleled unit of accounting, a thrimsa. Uh, linguistically, we know the thrimsa probably comes from Latin thrimsis or uh, triens, as sometimes it's called. It's a light uh, 
Roman uh, coin, but uh, Thrums probably never existed as a coin, probably it was another unit of measurement. Um, secondly, according to the text, a thanes wiggled among the northern people was 2,000 thrimses, and a churls was uh, 266, which I quote, is 200 shillings according to the Mercian law. Now, there's going to be a lot of arithmetics and currency names, so I beg you to bear with me. If Chadwick's ideas are correct, and they seem most likely to be correct, uh, a Mercian shilling was indeed four pence, then a thrimse must contain three pence. This means that 2,000 thrimses will be 6,000 pence, and if a West Saxon shilling was 25% cheaper than the Mercian one, this turns this sum into 1,200 shillings. Quod disputandum est, right? Well, not quite. And Chadwick was already aware of some narrow points in his scheme. What he didn't know in the early 1900s is that both these legal codes were edited by one and the same authority at the turn of the millennia, and that was likely the York Archbishop by the name of Woolston. Um, let uh, his office not deceive you. Woolston was not a Northumbrian, he was a Southerner, uh, but we do not know if he was a Mercian or a West Saxon, actually. But he was definitely not a Northumbrian. Therefore, these texts aren't independent pieces of evidence, as Chadwick thought, but he couldn't know it then because this fact was established much later. Uh, the biggest problem is that the whole equation hinges on a chain of mutually dependent concessions. So if we take these codes at face value, then we must acknowledge that the 6 to 1 ratio didn't hold among the so-called northern people, presumably the Northumbrians. The gap was larger, 7.5 to 1. Or the thanes Weigel should have been six, about 1,600 shillings, but this is not what we see in the text. Moreover, without any warning, the source suddenly switches the currency. The Charles Weigel is counted in Mercian shillings, 4 pence and a shilling. But the Thanes, it appears, in West Saxon shillings, and there's no indication of why. Or even if, 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 even if this is correct, this is Chadwick's reconstruction, and I actually do tend to follow it. Uh, finally, the evidence for a 1,200 shilling Weigel as such is exclusively West Saxon, apart from the same uh, Mercian laws quoted above. But the bestowal of this man price on a Thane is Mercian and Northumbrian. So my tentative solution uh, is to concede that at the heart of the Weigel system was not the actual monetary value, that is, how much silver you're going, you're going to get, but the number of, uh, but the conventional units of measure, the shillings or the thrimses. That would mean that once you cross the West Saxon Mercian legal border, your Weigel uh, would shrink by a quarter. Counting in pounds in Wessex, your life would have been worth uh, 25 pounds, and in Mercia only 20 pounds. Uh, is there additional evidence for it? Yes, there is, and it's a bit slight, and I am very well aware of this. Um, mm, an anonymous 12th, 12th century Anglo-Norman legal treatise uh, reports exactly that. Please see the slide. The differences between the uh, 20 pounds and the 25 pounds. The problem is that the source is very unreliable, and it uh, reports practices that are otherwise unknown. And I refer to the work by Patrick Wormald if you are more interested in this text. But this fact is recorded in the 12th century. Secondly, there's a treaty between uh, uh, King Ethelred the Unread and Olaf Tryggvason in 991, which uh, awards the free uh, Norsemen and Anglo Saxon. Anglo-Saxons are wiggled of 25 pounds, although this is later, and it's not clear why it's the freeman, so shall we equate the freeman with the things? This is a bit obscure, but again, this sum is mentioned. Um, so, so, um, mm, this is where my educated speculations come into play. With all this arithmetics and source criticism, what they mean is that we might be witnessing a deliberate attempt to extend, uh, to extend the West Saxon social system outwards. That the West Saxon society knew their position of the 1200 and the uh, 1200 men is beyond doubt. These categories are mentioned from the late 7th century. Did a similar ratio uh, also apply in Mercia? Well, this is possible, and then the Mercian law code would simply record this fact, but it was counted differently. But it is my educated guess or speculation that, in fact, it could have been, could have been an imposition from the West Saxon polity once Mercia was incorporated into uh, West, the West Saxon kingdom, in effect. Um, um, 
note that these texts do not fail to mention the legal character of the stipulation. Hence, we could see this in an innovation. So uh, the, um, the uh, 12th century text mentions the different wergels, the were, and the uh, Mirknalaga mentions that it is on, by the law that these ratios are supposed to be this way. But this is a very scant textual evidence, of course. Uh, what about Northumbria then? This is a hard case, actually. Uh, the maths is really weird here, but the only feasible explanation is that of Chadwick's. A Northumbrian churl was on par with his Mercian counterpart, that is, that he would be awarded 800 pence, but the thane's position resembled that from Wessex, so that would be 6,000 pence. So that would mean that the gap was larger than in Wessex or Mercia. Why and how this could have happened is currently a riddle for me. Uh, what is clear, though, is that from the textual evidence, it would seem that the equation of the 266 thrimses to 200 shillings was a conscious addition on the part of the editor or copist. Therefore, my interpretation is that either from the earliest time the gap between the ordinary freemen and the elite was large in this region, or that one of these wiggles was imposed artificially. Um, whatever the case, it appears to me that despite the unification attempts on the part of the official authorities, or perhaps Wilson himself, uh, it appears the social standing of a thane was in, not even throughout the kingdom, or maybe it was different people or groups of people called thanes in different regions. I do not really have an answer to this yet. Rory Naismith called Chadwick's long essay on the monetary system, I quote, a prelude to the main business which was using the data in locos to shed light on aspects of Anglo-Saxon society, end quote. What is the rationale behind my long prelude, prelude and what is my main business? Well, in the few minutes left, I'm going to posit rather complicated theoretical questions. And if anyone can suggest tentative uh, answers, I will be very grateful. So how do we apply this newly acquired knowledge of a thane's world? How did it function in the legal system as a whole? Most importantly, did the practice of monetary compensation for homicide exist outside the legal codes per se? Well, the evidence is a bit inconclusive. A legal historian would certainly subscribe to this contention because wiggles are mentioned all too often. Plus, anthropologists confirm that the very practice of monetary exculpation does exist. For example, it, used to, it, it was in practice in the modern-day Albania up until the 1950s, as far as I understand. Um, um, however, a positivist might discard my question on the grounds of the lack of explicit references in the sources. We do not really have any reference a thing was killed, 1,200 shillings were paid, or anything like that. In fact, payments of wiggles are very rare. As far as I know, there are two explicit uh, cases for the whole corpus, and our corpus is about 3 million words. Um, plus, whatever little we know about the Anglo-Saxon feudal practices, um, this does not seem to confirm the legal stipulations of the West Saxon kings who were also striving to make them virtually impossible and illegal in the 10th century. Nevertheless, a lack of evidence is not the evidence of a lack as such. Moreover, Levi Roach made a very persuasive case for how the legal codes actually functioned. They weren't the reference books that we would understand today. They were rather guidelines in the courtrooms. The judges could not perhaps quote them verbatim, but they were familiar with the king's policies in crime prosecutions. Uh, think of the sheriffs in the Wild West. Probably they were not the most educated and literate people, but they knew that they had to enforce the official law, and they probably had heard about this law and what kind of stipulations from other cases or, I don't know, from hearsay or something. Or think about the highway code. You are supposed to know it, but you are not supposed to carry it around with you each time you get in a car. You, you're, you're, when you are when you're driving, you are not actually open, or you do not actually open the the, the code and think, aha, uh -huh, paragraph five point two, I have to turn left here. This is not this is not how it actually works. Um, and so this might explain the lack of written evidence for the Wergild payments. But this opens a new problem. Assuming that Wergild was a working institute and the royal legislation had practical application. We still do not know anything about its implementation when we talk about the Thanes. So even if we established what a Thanes world was, is this useful knowledge? Uh, the answer depends on the question, uh, because there are no bad sources, there are only bad questions. Uh, perhaps we cannot know how an Anglo-Saxon court would handle a Thane homicide. But instead, we can perhaps say 
what a royal legislator had to say about it. In effect, basically, this condenses as follows. Perhaps what we observe in the legal sources is not how the social reality eigentlich gewesen war, but perhaps this is how the royal power was trying to mold the social reality uh, and uh, pursued to create a new historical ontology, high uh, And this leads to my conclusive and recursive question, what does knowing the sum of the things Wergel tell us about the society and the things in it? Who were they after all? Well, bearing in mind my touch on, th on theory at the beginning of this speech, I would like uh, to categorize the concept of a Wergel as a marker of a social status in a sociological application, or der Stand, as the German scholarship would have it. Mm, I prefer this definition by uh, Max Weber. Uh, as you can see, I'm a bit Weberian. Um, diving into the realm of theory, oh, sorry, I didn't put it right through. Diving into the realm of theory, Timothy Reuter, a British medievalist with, of a German origin, separated aristocracy and nobility as terms. Basically, an aristocrat is someone who is acknowledged as such by the members of a community, so a de facto elite member, whilst a nobleman is a legally privileged character, so this character might not necessarily hold power, but is recognized as someone who is special, a special snowflake. Uh, so perhaps what we see in these sources that I examined today is a deliberate social engineering, quote-unquote, by the West Saxon kings who were trying to leg uh, legalize and uh, the new de facto position of their thanes, because a thane literally means a servant. That is to say, uh, there had always existed a West Saxon nobility whose legal privilege was the entitlement to a higher 1,200 shilling wergeld, but it merged with the Thanes, or maybe vice versa, only much later in the 10th century, or maybe even on the eve of the Norman conquest. The, the question of dating is very open here. And on this question mark, I'd like to finish, and I'm looking forward to your questions and comments, should there be any. Thank you very much.